I, let, I thought let me begin by really addressing the question that I guess is foremost on everyone's mind, which is that is the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, unconstitutional? Is it anti-Muslim? And is it pro-Hindu? And I'm going to, over the next few minutes, attempt to argue before you that a compelling case can be made. It's no, by no means certain. It's not an open and shut case. But a compelling argument can be made that the Citizenship Amendment Act is unconstitutional. But the question of whether it is anti-Muslim or pro-Hindu is something that we need to investigate. The question of whether the CAA violates the secular history of our republic, whether it violates the secular fabric of the Indian constitution, is a premise that I'd like to interrogate a little bit. Let me begin by telling you about the unsecular origins of the Indian citizenship provisions of the Indian constitution. You see, when the country was partitioned in 1947, two waves of migration took place from West Pakistan to India. In the first wave, which occurred after March 1947, first March 1947 is when the disturbances began. There was a wave of migrations from West Pakistan to India. That was a migration of Hindus and Sikhs. They came in large numbers, obviously. But there was a second wave of migration which took place from West Pakistan to India, and that occurred in 1948, where interestingly, large numbers of Indian Muslims who had left India to go to Pakistan, realized that Pakistan was not what they had thought it might be and therefore returned to India. Now you see, the return of the Muslim in India created problems for the Indian administration. By the way, the law created these, considered these two categories to be different. So the law referred to Hindus and Sikhs as displaced persons, but the law referred to Muslims who left as evacuees. So these two were different categories in the law. And you see, Muslims who left India to go to Pakistan, their property was referred to as evacuee property. And their property was being used to rehabilitate Hindus and Sikhs who had come from West Pakistan to India. So the question arose, if Muslims want to come back to India, what will happen to their evacuee property? So correspondence ensued among leaders whose secular credentials are absolutely unquestionable. Leaders like Nehru and Sardar Vallabhai Patel. And Sardar Patel wrote to Nehru and said that, look, the return of the Indian Muslim to India is creating trouble. We are in a charged communal environment. There's, a, there's been an influx of a large number of refugees in India. And if we, are, if we give the, the perception that we are going to now remove Hindus and Sikhs from the evacuee property and give it back to Muslims, this is really going to be something that's going to feed the communal poison of organizations like the RSS. This is really to paraphrase what Sardar Vallabhai Patel said. And it was in this context that the Indian government introduced on 19th July 1948, a system that was essentially designed to keep Muslims from coming back to India. That was called the permit system. Under this system, if a Muslim wanted to come back to India, mind you, the system did not mention Hindu or Muslim. All it said was that if you were somebody who left India and wanted to return to India, in other words, Muslim, then the provincial government where your property was located had the power to veto your return to India. In other words, a permit for permanent resettlement, as it was called, could be refused to you if your property was being used to rehabilitate displaced persons, in other words, Hindus and Sikhs. This system essentially was entrenched in the Indian constitution. The Indian constitution in articles 5, 6, and 7 did not mention Hindu, Sikh, Muslim. It did not say anything about religion. So on its face, it appears to be extremely secular. But when you investigate a little bit further and you read the debates of the constituent assembly, you realize that actually there was a very hidden, there were two hidden premises in the Indian constitution. For those who came prior to the permit system being introduced, 19 July 1948, who were presumed largely to be Hindus and Sikhs, citizenship was automatic in the words of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. All that was required is that you had to arrive in India and live in India since then. That's very easy. But for those who came after 19 July 1948, especially those who had left India and now sought to return, you required a permit for permanent resettlement. 
Now you see in the Constituent Assembly, there was a great debate that ensued. There was some, some voices who said that, look, we should give citizenship on the basis of religion. So there was a man by the name of Mr. Deshmukh who was an Oxford educated barrister. Uh, there was a man by the name of Pandit Thakur Das Bhargav who was responsible for the directive principle of state policy that uh, calls upon the state to prevent the slaughter of cows and cattle. Also responsible for the introduction of the word reasonable into the Indian constitution when it comes to our liberties. These people essentially said that we should have religion, uh, citizenship on the basis of religion. To address their criticism in the Constituent Assembly, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru stood up and he explained these hidden premises in the Indian constitution. He said that, look, obviously we can't have two separate systems for Hindus and Sikhs on the one hand and for Muslims on the other. But for those who came prior to 19 July 1948, and we presume most of them were Hindus and Sikhs, citizenship was automatic. We accepted the great first wave of migration practically without any demur or inquiry, that those were his words. For those who come after 19 July 1948, we have the permit system. Now mind you, when the permit system was introduced, the first president of India, President Rajendra Prasad, was extremely worried that a very large number of permits would be issued. And he wrote to Nehru and said that, look, you're going to issue 10,000 permits a month. But actually, by August 1948, when Nehru stood up in the Constituent Assembly to explain the citizenship provisions of the Indian Constitution, Nehru explained that only 2,000 permits for permanent resettlement had been issued. So mind you, in March, around March 1948, about 22,000 Muslims had arrived in India. That was the rate at which Muslims were coming back to India from Pakistan. But once the permit system was introduced, only 2,000 permits for permanent resettlement had been issued. And Nehru said that, look, we've taken great care to ensure that these permits are only issued in the most uh, grave circumstances or in the most serious cases. What to me really is very telling is that the permit system was not introduced for East Pakistan. And this is something when I looked at the Constituent Assembly debates that made me wonder, it, it puzzled me. Why is it that a permit was introduced for West Pakistan but not for East Pakistan? And you see, when you dig into the correspondence of our leaders, leaders like Nehru and Patel, you realize that while there were only about seven or 800,000 Hindus left in Pakistan, in West Pakistan, there were 16 million Hindus in East Pakistan at the time that the permit system was introduced. In other words, if the permit system had been introduced for East Pakistan in July 1948, it would have created, it would have prevented Hindus from coming back to India, many of whom were being forced to either convert to Islam or to leave. So this, I would submit really before all of you, does really undermine the secular credentials and the secular origins of the Indian constitution. There are dark parts of the Indian constitution. In a book that I wrote a couple of years ago, I examined the provisions of the Indian constitution that deal with the freedom of speech and expression. And I found that really what the constitution did, and this is a minor digression, was really to entrench the existing laws. So all the exceptions to the right to free speech that existed when the British ruled us, sedition, defamation, contempt of court, obscenity, they all were just continued under Article 19.2 of the Indian Constitution and we have to face this dark history of the Indian Constitution. However, I do believe that a compelling argument can be made that the Citizenship Amendment Act as it stands today is unconstitutional because of Article 14 of the Indian Constitution which grants to every person, not merely every citizen, the right to equality and the equal protection of the laws within the territories of India. And there are four or five reasons really why one could argue that the Citizenship Amendment Act is unconstitutional because it violates the equality provisions of the Indian Constitution. I'm sure many of you have heard those arguments already. One of the arguments is that it excludes certain categories of religious groups. It excludes Jews. I'm not able to understand why Jews have been left out from the Citizenship Amendment Act. And on social media when I posted a paper that I'd written, somebody said, well, Jews have Israel. Okay. But we have one of my very good friends is a Jew in Calcutta. Jews also have India. And if Jews have Israel, then Christians and Buddhists have their own countries too. We've included Christians and Buddhists, but we've left out Jews. That doesn't make sense to me. What about Baha'is? Baha'is have no country of their own. We've left out Baha'is. You've left out atheists, people who believe that there is no God.
blasphemy attracts the death penalty, it is blasphemous to say that there is no God. <laughs> You've excluded people who don't know if there's a God or not, agnostics, people who are doubtful about whether there's a God or not. You've left out categories of Muslims who may be considered minorities in countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, categories like Ahmadiyas or Hazares. So there are religious groups that have been excluded. And it's no answer to say that, well, religion is established in these countries, because I, I'd like to remind all of you today that there are other countries where religions are established. Has anyone heard of the United Kingdom? Where Christianity, through the Church of England, is the established religion. The Queen appoints the Archbishop of Canterbury, the senior bishops sit on the House of Lords, a senior member of the clergy crowns the Queen. So merely because a country has an established religion, what we would call a theocratic state, does not necessarily mean that it's unsecular. Um, so that's no answer. You've left out other countries in India's neighborhood. What really perplexes me is, and, and this, is, this is something, uh, one of the other reasons why one could argue that it's unconstitutional, is that the residence requirement in India is reduced by the Citizenship Amendment Act. So anyone else who wants to apply to be a citizen by naturalization has to reside in India for 11 years. But for somebody who falls within the Citizenship Amendment Act, the, re the residence requirement is only five years. Now, what really perplexes me is that look how this applies to the, the group that we all know as Parsis. Parsis originally fled Iran. There are still Parsis who live in Iran under circumstances that one might consider to be very repressive. A Parsi who flees religious persecution in Iran and comes to India has to wait 11 years to be naturalized as a citizen. But a Parsi who flees religious persecution in Afghanistan has to wait in India for only five years to be a naturalized citizen, that doesn't make any sense to me. There are other reasons why one could argue that the Citizenship Amendment Act is unconstitutional. One is the cutoff date. The cutoff date is 31st December 2014. So if you suffer religious persecution before 31st December 2014, but you come to India on the 1st of January 2015, then you are not entitled to the protections of the Citizenship Amendment Act. Now look, one must, I must point out that bright line rules are imposed by the law. For example, you can vote at the age of 18. So if I'm a day younger than 18 before the general elections, I'm not entitled to vote. Similarly, you are entitled to marry at a certain age, you're entitled to drink alcohol at a certain age. The law does impose bright line rules. But here the bright line rule that has been imposed seems to undermine the ostensibly humanitarian objective of the law which is that if you want to... If you want to protect people who've been persecuted on account of their religion, then why close the doors on 31st December 2014? Apart from that, you've also excluded categories who suffer non-religious persecution. After the, sec the striking down of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, uh, somebody who might want to come here because of their sexual identity uh, is not given the benefit of the Citizenship Amendment Act. There may be racial reasons why somebody might be persecuted in a country in India's neighborhood. Those persons have been excluded from the Citizenship Amendment Act as well. But apart from that, there are some deeper problems with Indian citizenship law. It's not only the Citizenship Amendment Act, as Harsh was saying, and this goes, much be goes back much before the enactment of the Citizenship Amendment Act. One of the problems, as Harsh identified, with Indian citizenship law is the fact that we've abandoned the notion of citizenship by birth. Really, prior to 1987, anybody born in this country, no matter who their parents were, was entitled to be a citizen by birth. After 19, if you're born after 1987, but before 2004, you have to establish that you were born here and that one of your parents is an Indian citizen. In other words, one of your parents was born here and the other could be an illegal uh, alien, or you don't have to prove the citizenship of your other parent. After December 2004, you have to prove that you were born here, that your, one of your parents is an Indian citizen, and the other is not an illegal alien. Now, this tends to operate very harshly against certain categories of people. Let me ask you this question. What if you're an orphan? You don't know who your parents are. You're an orphan born after 1987, or an orphan born after 2004. You have to prove that your parents are citizens and you don't even know who they are. What if you are a transgendered person as, and very often in, in India, <laughs> transgendered people are abandoned.
transgender people are abandoned at birth. Again, you don't know who your parents are. How do you establish that your parents were Indian citizens? Apart from that, let me tell you about a category that in the US would be referred to as dreamers. Let's assume that you are actually an illegal, you know who your parents are. Your parents are both illegal Bangladeshi immigrants in India. They both came to India, they crossed the border illegally, they came and they settled down in Maharashtra, and you were born in Maharashtra. Now I ask you a question. Is it the fault of that child being born in India? Is being born a crime? Now that child did not come here illegally. That child has only known India as his or her homeland. Is it fair to now deport that person to a country that that person has never known, or to jail that person simply for the crime of being born in India? I'll, I'll only conclude with another example. Let me say that you're not born in India, that you came here along with your parents at the age of two or three. Again, when you cross the border along with your illegal immigrant parents, it's not your fault that you came here, but the law tends to operate harshly against dreamers. I'm happy to discuss uh, some of these points. Um, uh, there's some more problems with Indian citizenship, uh, citizenship law uh, in the question and answer session. Uh, I'm really grateful to all of you. Thank you.